right? Uh, so that is not something that has typically been seen uh, you know, during previous uh, co uh, coronavirus pandemics. Another thing that is very striking is that we see several cases of um, COVID-19 vaccinated people uh, who got the full cor course of the vaccine, so the two, the two shots, and that are already shedding highly infectious variants. So those cases have been reported as well. So this already indicates that uh, COVID-19 is indeed able to escape uh, host immunity. As you will see in every textbook on vaccinology, even immunology, is if you allow virus replication, for example, on a background of suboptimal immune response, you will, you will give the, uh, the virus uh, uh, a possibility to escape the immune response, especially, especially of course, if these are uh, highly uh, mutable uh, viruses. So um, the current uh, COVID-19 vaccine technologies, as I was saying, no matter uh, what the manufacturing process is, all of them are targeted. That's the purpose of those vaccines, that inducing specific antibodies to the spike protein. And, they, uh, and particularly the uh, receptor binding uh, domain that is uh, localized within S1. And so as a matter of fact, no one of them prevents really viral replication if the antibodies, of course, are, for example, too low or if uh, the affinity is too low. So this is to say because of their specificity, uh, the high level of specificity, they are not able to control replication of uh, variants uh, that are uh, actually circulating that are more uh, infectious. That was what I explained uh, previously because they are so, the, the immune response is so specific and the variants are of course different uh, from, uh, have a spike protein that is already quite different from the one that was used uh, in the vaccine. And um, so another thing is that they may not be, uh, be able to uh, prevent immune escape. This is especially the case, as I previously mentioned, you see fully vaccinated subjects and uh, that are exposed to viral variants and, and they allow already viral replication. Uh, not yet the severe disease, but still viral replication and shedding. So are these vaccines safe? Yes, of course they are safe. I mean, I'm the first to say that they have uh, been tested properly. They have been scrutinized uh, by, by several people, but uh, regulatory authorities have, uh, have done a, 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 a marvelous job. And uh, I think it, there is no doubt about the safety of those vaccines, but this is all at the level of the individual. Are these vaccines safe? And I will I will illustrate you why I'm saying this in, in, in the upcoming slides. They are, they are not safe at all if it comes to, if we talk about human populations that are exposed to COVID-19 pandemic. Please don't forget what we are doing right now is that we are doing mass vaccinations in the heat of a pandemic, right? And um, same with the efficacy. Are these uh, vaccines efficacious? I mean, we see all these discussions, uh, 80%, 85, uh, 92, whatever. Yes, they have a high level. Of, uh, uh, sorry? W was, somebody, was somebody trying to ask something? Okay, I continue. So are they efficacious? Yes, they are efficacious, all, again, at level of the individual. Are they efficacious for really fighting the pandemic in huge human populations, I will illustrate in my upcoming slides that this is highly questionable. I'm convinced is not the case, but I will explain. So what are, let's first have a look at the normal, at the natural, the natural without human intervention, the natural course of a viral pandemic, of a coronavirus pandemic. So I'm distinguishing always between two types of the population. The one population that is almost uh, naturally protected due to innate immunity. And uh, I will show you in one of the next slides that this is in fact due to uh, killing of the virus uh, through natural antibodies. And this killing is antigen non-specific. This is to say that this type of killing will work for all several different coronaviruses, uh, including of course COVID and including all the variants. 
And uh, so, so this killing is the combination uh, of natural antibodies and, uh, and K cells. And there is increasing evidence now that uh, people who are asymptomatically infected have uh, high levels of NK cells uh, in, in the blood. So there is increasing evidence that uh, this is in, in, indeed the type of innate immunity that prevent uh, these people from, uh, from being ill, from, from getting severe disease. Whereas in the non, uh, and you see the legend at the bottom of the slide, non nax so these are all the other people. These are the people that when exposed to COVID infection, they tend to, to develop severe disease. And uh, they contract basically the disease because of weak innate immunity. We know all these people, especially the elderly, uh, uh, people with heavy uh, underlying diseases or uh, other people that are otherwise uh, immune suppressed. So what, and unfortunately some of these people die, but uh, those who survive are typically going to develop antigen specific uh, neutralizing antibodies and uh, they will provide them with of course protection. Uh, again, when uh, these antibodies start to wane, these people become again susceptible to disease. So we have somewhere the uh, quite uh, naive interpretation of uh, the development of a pandemic saying, well, you know, we have a new coronavirus. We first have people with uh, a weak innate immunity uh, who get the disease. And uh, when these people develop then an adaptive immunity in case they survive, of course, uh, they will only get uh, susceptible to the disease once again when their antibodies start to, uh, to wane. And that is when you see again uh, outbreaks, etc. So there is a number of questions that we actually don't understand very well. Uh, and I'm essentially going to cap capitalize on the second question. So first question is, well, why uh, does a natural uh, viral pandemic comprise three waves? And I'll show you in the, in, in the third slide that this is typically the case for a natural pandemic caused by an acute self-limiting viral infection, for example, coronavirus, you could also have enterovirus, etc. So uh, why does the second wave typically hit the younger people? And why does the virus re-emerge uh, to become seasonal uh, after a pandemic? So let's uh, look, have a look at the, um, at the next slide where, as I was saying, I would capitalize on the second question, why it uh, primarily the, the second wave hits the younger people. And you can see that not only it, uh, and, and this is uh, the, um, well, the example, of course, of the influenza pandemic in 1918, which is very often uh, by experts uh, uh, considered to be a, a good example of uh, actually a pandemic of an acute self-limiting uh, disease. And um, typically when the second wave hit the younger people, the younger age groups, and it was much more severe. And, and this has never been really well explained. So of course you would think, well, as the major source of the viral spread, and these are the, the people who are vulnerable to the disease, because you know, if you have the disease, you typically are gonna transmit and spread uh, much more virus. So uh, for the virus, it's, 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 this, are the interesting, this is the interesting source of viral replication. This is the interesting reservoir for viral replication, and uh, this uh, where people get symptoms. But you can imagine as uh, more and more uh, of these vulnerable people get the disease, etc the capacity for the virus to replicate will diminish because there will always be less vulnerable people. So at some point, the, vi the virus will need to shift to people who actually were naturally protected and yeah, in one way or the other, make them more susceptible so that the virus can now replicate and also make use of this reservoir. But this is not, 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 uh, not easy to understand. So the question is, how does that work? Why all of a sudden do these people become more susceptible? Where I was just saying previously that they are normally naturally protected, not only against uh, one single strain, but against several different uh, variants. So therefore it's important that we have a look at um, what is actually uh, causing asymptomatic infection. Well, asymptomatic infection, uh, we know that these people shed virus for a short uh, time. So it's, uh, it's very short-lived. This is maybe a, a week or so. 
And then there is complete abrogation of the uh, infection in, in, in those people that are naturally protected. And it is now increasingly clear that this abrogation is caused by innate immunity. So you have the COVID virus, you have the natural antibodies uh, at the level of the uh, upper respiratory tract, and these are IgMs that are complexing the, the virus. This virus is then internalized into dendritic cells, antigen-presenting cells, and they will present a pattern of non-antigen-specific motifs. These non-antigenic-specific uh, motifs that have some similarity with cell molecules will typically be recognized by natural killer cells. And that's why you see that natural killer cells in asymptomatically infected people will, will uh, dramatically increase after they have cleared the infection. So because these natural killer cells are then, of course, uh, capable of killing the epithelial cells that have been infected with the virus. So abrogation of this viral infection at an early stage, it's a very early stage of infection where uh, the, the virus is still only replicating in the upper respiratory um, airway. It's the, the virus secret weapon to ensure its own perpetuation. And why is this? Well, typically because the virus only replicates uh, or is shed for a, a short time, uh, also the immune response that will follow after this short-lived viral transmission and, and replication is also relatively weak. First of all, it's much weaker than, for example, in symptomatically infected uh, patients. And it's also, it's also very important, it's very short-lived. But this, and, and so it's interesting, it's interesting to note that, uh, so basically the antibodies that are generated after uh, asymptomatic infection are not those that are responsible for clearing the virus. I just showed you that the virus is cleared, is eliminated by natural immunity, the combination of the natural antibodies together with the natural killer cells. So it's not the goal or the purpose of this neutralizing antibodies was uh, very mysterious. Uh, nobody really knows, uh, well, you know, what is the purpose of these antibodies? Uh, they're short-lived and uh, they are relatively weak. There is no boost, the titers are pretty low. Well, these short-lived antigen-specific antibodies, they are capable of suppressing the binding of Coronavirus, I, I'm, I'm talking in general coronavirus because it doesn't matter when you talk about innate immunity and whether it is the original strain or whether it is the variant, these viruses can be bound by the multi-antigen specific IgMs. So these IgMs, these natural antibodies are multi-antigen specific. So they are not antigen specific, but, but the antigen specific IgGs, even if they are short-lived in an asymptomatically infected uh, person, their avidity for the coronavirus is always higher than uh, the avidity of the affinity of the IgMs for the virus. So in other words, as soon as you have antigen specific IgGs popping up, they will outcompete the natural antibodies for binding to the virus. And uh, so by doing this, they will, of course, dampen the innate immunity. They will not give a chance to these antibodies, the IgMs, to complex uh, with the virus. And by doing so, to stimulate, to train the innate immunity, which has no memory, as you know. So in fact, asymptomatic infection momentarily weakens the innate immunity but without providing protective adaptive immunity, because as I was telling you, I mean, the elimination of the virus is not, uh, is not done by the seroneutralizing antibodies, but it occurred uh, before uh, by uh, innate immunity. So that is also the reason, or that, that also explains why the antibodies and the elimination occurs almost like simultaneously, or even the antibodies come a little bit later. Whereas if they would be functional in terms of eliminating the virus, they would need to come before, right? So uh, by weakening now the adaptive, the innate immunity, automatically you will increase the susceptibility to the disease of these people who previously were naturally protected. So because what you do is that this uh, transient increase in antibodies will all of a sudden suppress 
their innate immunity and hence make them more susceptible to disease. Remember, that is the reason why people are originally with weak innate immunity uh, are easily infected and, 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 and get the disease. So uh, what does this mean? Well, imagine if you now have increasing infection rates and um, so people get increasingly uh, in, in infected during uh, the pandemic. And this will clearly enhance innate immune suppression in people who are normally naturally protected. So how do you, how do you explain this? Well, it, it's, it's, it's quite simple. The, the more the infection spreads, and that is primarily the spreaders, the key spreaders are, of course, the people that get the disease, because if you get symptoms, you spread the disease. You spread it much more than the uh, uh, people do that are only um, uh, asymptomatically infected. So if now you imagine that the infection spreads more and more, more, more and more people get infected, well, then the likelihood that the virus encounters somebody who is naturally protected just at the very time where he or she still has antibodies, because I told you they, were, they are short-lived, these antibodies are short-lived, increases. If the antibodies are only short-lived, well, normally, if the infection, infectious pressure is not high, the likelihood that you would have this transient increase of antibodies and just you know, encounter the virus is pretty low. The higher the infection rate, the higher the likelihood that somebody who is naturally protected will encounter the virus at the very moment where he happens to have this uh, seroneutralizing antibodies. So that is to say that the more the virus has used the capacity of the people that have symptomatic infection to spread, uh, the more this capacity is used, the more the capacity of the naturally protected uh, individuals will increase. So there is a compensatory increase in the viral replication capacity because now the naturally infected, uh, the naturally protected uh, individuals become more susceptible to the disease and hence they are going to spread more virus. So in this way, the virus ensures propagation and ensures its, its, um, its uh, uh, persistence. So increased susceptibility rates in um, uh, the uh, naturally uh, protected uh, individuals suffices, in fact, to compensate for long enough. This is to say, what is long enough? Well, the virus just needs to persist till the vulnerable people who got the disease and who mounted antibodies start to lose their antibodies again, eh? because these titers are going to wane again. And then the virus can again infect those people and replenish its replication capacity. So that is how it shifts during a normal pandemic, I would say, to the younger people uh, who are uh, typically those that have uh, the uh, that are naturally protected, and uh, and the elderly uh, and the elderly people, those who are uh, the first uh, that get infected because of uh, weak innate immunity and will mount protective antibodies. So. Um, what, what happens now? Uh, so I explained to you what happens during no, a normal uh, pandemic and how the, the, the virus can perpetuate through this trick, in fact. So what happens now if we come with containment measures and all the infection prevention measures? Well, uh, you know, in, in one of my previous slides, I, I told you abrogation of viral infection at an early stage of infection is the virus secret weapon to ensure its own perpetuation. Now I'm adding to this, but still, it does this while leaving the door open for increasing its infectiousness when the infection rates drop. What does that mean? Well, if you come, of course, with severe, stringent, global, worldwide uh, infection prevention measures, of course, the, the, you will give the virus a difficult time to spread and to transmit. So the infection rate will drop. And so how is the virus going to compensate for this? Well, he still has an opportunity. The virus has still an opportunity. And the, the opportunity is given by the asymptomatically infected people. How does that work? Well, as I told you, the virus replication in the naturally 
protected individuals is under control of the innate immune system. So what the virus can do at this moment, you have the, the, the virus is going to affect these people. They are going to mount antibodies in the presence, of course, of resistance of the innate immune system. Well, if the virus wants to replicate more, it needs to escape from this innate immune system. And it's going to, mute, to, to introduce some mutations that enable to escape from the innate immune system. This is to say, these uh, mutations will enable the virus to become more infectious. So the infectiousness of the virus is going to raise in, to compensate for the lower infection rates that uh, the virus was subject to due to human intervention. This is to say the prevention, uh, the, the prevention measures. So, as I just mentioned, that enables the virus to increase the viral infectiousness in the uh, prote naturally protected subjects. And that is what we are seeing right now. All of a sudden, we see popping up these highly infectious strains, or as you know, I'm go not going to expand on this, but there are several of them. And um, you would say, OK, well, this, uh, this trick is now going to enable the virus to compensate for this drop in infection rates that we impose to the virus uh, for long enough. Well, again, long enough would mean till the people who were vulnerable have developed their protective antibodies are going to lose those antibodies. This is to say, uh, for long enough till the antibodies drop in those, um, well, I call them the non acts the uh, vulnerable people who have developed antibodies. So, but then the question is, but what if these antibodies don't drop? So now, if you have this non-nax and the vulnerable people with the antibodies, but the antibodies are sustained, they don't wane, how can that come? How is that possible? Well, this is possible, of course, if you vaccinate people. If you vaccinate people, you are going to generate a long-lived antibody types, much longer than, your, than after natural infection. And they, so the, the virus cannot compensate then. Well, yes, the virus will become more infectious. That is the only weapon the virus has because in the innate immune system, it can, of the, of the NAX, it can escape to this immune system simply by introducing mutations in the S protein. It enables the virus to become more infectious. And this is going to continue till I call this the return on escape mutations in this non-NAC, so in the vulnerable people, becomes relatively more profitable for the virus. So what does that mean? OK, the virus can introduce mutations in, in, the, uh, in the S protein and to make, uh, of course, the uh, normally naturally protected uh, individuals uh, more susceptible. But of course, this has a limit if, if, if that has happened in uh, a big, uh, a large amount of people, then the capacity is limited again. So then the virus says, well, that is not says, but of course that is, that is how it works. It becomes more profitable at that moment for the virus to introduce mutations that are going to resist the humoral antibodies in the people that have been vaccinated. Because now, if the virus succeeds in doing that, all of a sudden, it, it, it increases its reservoir for uh, augmenting uh, the capacity of viral replication tremendously. So it was uh, more or less had reached the limit, uh, despite increasing infectiousness, in doing this in, in the NACs. But now, when indeed it, it succeeds in doing this in the non acts but then really directed mutations directed against uh, the uh, vaccinal antibodies, then again, a big reservoir becomes available for the virus. So that is where we are going to see uh, escape mutations that are directed against the receptor binding domain, because that is what uh, I started my talk with is that this is what uh, is especially targeted by uh, the vaccinal antibodies just to rebuild sufficient capacity to ensure a sufficient viral replication. And that would be, mean that the resulting immune escape variants are resistant to the vaccine. So what I'm saying is that 
increasing infection or increasing seropositivity rates, so increasing seropositivity rates can be due to vaccination, of course, in people who are normally natural, naturally vulnerable and therefore is the first group that we vaccinate, for example, the elderly or immune suppressed people, they will go into, they will promote immune escape. So the, this, this enhanced rates uh, will lead to innate immune suppression because antigen specific antibodies, as I told you, will outcompete natural antibodies for binding to coronavirus and, and hence they will prevent the training of the innate immune system. But if this compensation is not sufficient, then of course the virus will escape to this in, innate immune response to be able to regain sufficient, uh, sufficient capacity. So we see that uh, a selective immune escape in these naturally protected individuals will automatically lead to increased infectiousness. We are already seeing this uh, right now, but this increased infectiousness if it cannot go anywhere, because if despite this increased infectiousness, the capacity of the, um, the, the, the capacity for the virus to replicate in the naturally protected individuals uh, shrinks, continues to shrink, then of course, it will be more profitable for the virus to start introducing mutations, not randomly in the S protein, but, but in this specific domain, the receptor binding domain, because this is the one that protects now the whole cohort of um, vaccinated people, because these antibodies are specifically directed against this domain. So, I mean, if you look at the current COVID pandemic uh, with human intervention, so I'm talking about, uh, of course, the uh, containment measures, I'm also talking about vaccination, we see already atypical courses of, of uh, waves of the pandemic. It's not like what I showed you for flu, the natural, natural pandemic. It's a completely bizarre picture what we see. So that is, that is already pretty suspicious. But then, of course, the emergence of several much more infectious strains, frankly speaking, we have never seen this uh, during a pandemic, that all of a sudden, much more infectious strains are uh, popping up. And then, of course, the quite scary finding that viral shedding uh, in fully vaccinated subjects. So that is a situation. These people have high antibody types. Nevertheless, they shed the virus. So the virus is able to escape to some extent. They are not getting uh, the disease right now. But uh, I mean, this is uh, something which is very clearly evolving because if now the virus manages to make these people ill despite their antibodies, then again, it will gain a huge reservoir for viral replication capacity. So um, this is a, a kind of summary slide. So mass containment measures, because don't forget, we are doing this at large scale. We are doing this globally. And mass vac vaccination in the non -ax accelerates immune escape, whereas mass vaccination of the naturally protected people would enhance the disease and the mortality rates in these people. And why is this? Well, as I was saying, if the naturally protected people, they develop a natural infection, well, they will just have short-lived antibodies, short-lived antibodies that will just momentarily suppress their innate immune response, which momentarily makes them more susceptible. If now you're doing this on a permanent basis, you vaccinate these people, well, they will no longer have long-lived, uh, short-lived uh, antibody titers. They will have long-lived antibody titers. So you are completely uh, suppressing their innate immune system for a long time. So this is, of course, rendering these people not momentarily more susceptible, but durably uh, more susceptible. So in other ways, Containment is, of course, going to favor, to promote innate immune escape. And uh, vaccination of non nacs is going to promote innate immune escape in the NACs. That, of course, will lead to high infection, more infectious strains. And the more these uh, strains become infectious, the more they can compensate for the loss of viral replication. But there is a limit, of course, because the reservoir of the NACs is not unlimited, and then it becomes more profitable for the virus to start to work on mutations in the receptor binding domain. 
to regain a full capacity of the non NACs who are no longer uh, protected. So this is to say that if needed, both NACs and non-NACs can serve as a potential source of immune escape upon human intervention in a natural coronavirus pandemic. Of course, you can imagine if you first do this, that you make almost the virus so infectious that it can even succeed in uh, escaping the adaptive immune response in the vaccinated people, and then afterwards, you completely suppress the innate immunity in the people that are normally naturally protected, that is our younger generation, then of course, you have a recipe for a major catastrophe because you are going to fully unleash the highly infectious uh, variants. So, and by that, uh, people, I will uh, end my talk, but um, I am more than concerned about this. And this is now something that is shared worldwide with all responsible health organizations, because don't forget, we do mass vaccinations with vaccines, and I'm not criticizing the vaccines that are good for prophylactic use, but since they cannot kill the virus, they cannot eradicate it, we drive immune escape in those different populations. And, and that is something to consider because you do this at very large scale. I thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open for questions uh, if you like. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greet, uh, Peter Nara is having a question for you. So Peter Nara, can you come the, off mic and ask your questions if you would like? Uh, Garrett, hi, Peter Nara, how are you? Hi, Peter. It's been a long time, right? Yes. You, you yes. remember me, yeah. Yes, good to hear yeah. from you and see you. Yeah, yeah, same here. Okay. Yeah. So, um, enjoyed the discussion, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, I'm curious, then, given where, where we are and how, of course, the innate uh, system and the um, sort of adaptive system that we're pushing through vaccination right now, what do you see is the middle of the road uh, better approach given where we are? Well, I, I'm very grateful for your question, uh, Peter. And I let just give me a second to go back to this slide. Can you see it? Yep. So what would be the solution? I mean, the solution is quite obvious. As I was telling you, the natural killer cells they are capable of killing coronavirus regardless of the type of coronavirus, regardless of the type of variants. And that is because these cells, they do not recognize specifically certain antigens. Right. What they recognize are antigen non-specific patterns. Right. So NK cells are not antigen specific. They recognize antigen non-specific patterns that are presented on pathologically altered cells, not just infected cells, but also, for example, cancer cells, etc. Right. And by doing that, they can, of course, attack uh, epithelial cells that are infected by, you know, regardless what, what which coronavirus and even other viruses to some extent. But what is, of course, the disadvantage of these guys? They don't have memory. They don't have memory. And that is the reason why, frankly speaking, I mean, locking up our young people, as we have been doing during the, 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 the initial, uh, the, the, the start of the pandemic and, and closing schools, etc. I mean, this was the most stupid thing to do, because if you want to maintain this good innate immunity, you have to train it, right? It has no memory. So mm -hmm. if, we, if we would find a method to vaccinate that would enable those NK cells to acquire memory, and we know, I mean, back 10 years ago, people said, uh, it's just innate immunity, there is no memory. There is no compelling evidence, in, you know, generated in the last five, six years that NK cells can acquire memory. And that is, for me personally, in all modesty, the only way out of this. Because don't forget, we have now highly infectious strains, right? And normally a pandemic, I mean, 
there is uh, periods of quiescence, and all of a sudden the virus pops up again, but that is not a more infectious strain. That is exactly the same strain that was responsible for the wave that, you know, one year ago, for example. So now, even if we do a lockdown for three months where we get back to this quiescence, when something happens, of course, the, the immunity of the people will weaken again, etc. The guys that will pop up are these very same highly infectious strains, right? And that is dramatic. And the more we prevent uh, this, you know, these strains, in fact, from, I would say, shifting away from the, the younger people, I mean, the more they are going to increase their infectiousness, as I tried to explain, because, I mean, if, if those who are not vaccinated, the elder people, they are not, you know, they have no, the virus has no access to them, then the only way to ensure its replication is to become more infectious. And it can do this because its replication in the next is under control of the immune system. So it just basically needs to escape from the immune response, which is to say become more infectious and you know, introduce additional mutations in the spike protein. So this is a very, very scary development. There is a solution, but I mean, uh, it's, it's not gonna be immediate. And, and yeah, I, I hate to say, I hate to say, that, um, and I'm calling for it, I'm really calling for it worldwide to all world leaders, all leading health organizations, including CDC, NIH, the WHO, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, uh, you, you name them, I mean, um, to stop the mass vaccination because we are gonna drive immune escape up to a point where, I mean, this is for me threatening to-, to, to, to Mr. Green.